<laughs> okay, so before handing the reins over to our authors, let me very briefly introduce each of them. Um, Dr. Zavala came to the ANU only about six months ago, but has already um, been making significant contributions to our intellectual endeavours here. Before arriving here, she was a laureate um, postdoctoral fellow at the Melbourne Law School and holds a PhD degree from Durham in the United Kingdom and undergraduate, I'm not actually sure, somewhere in Greece, in yes. Athens, University of Athens, fantastic. Um, she's published very widely already in leading journals such as the Leading Journal of International Law, the Yale Journal of Law and Humanity, the European International Law Journal, um, and is widely acknowledged as one of the most interesting scholars currently writing about the history and theory of international law. She's also a member of the Editorial Collective on the Twail Review and is a special advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Now, um, in the case of Associate Professor Will Bateman, what to say? I mean, I've known Will for a very long time. Um, in the acknowledgements, he actually outs himself as one of the garrulous undergraduates <laughs> to have been through this law school, school over the years. Um, in the intervening years since he was with us as a law student, Will completed his PhD and also LLM at Cambridge. He's worked in practice and has had a stint working for both federal court judges and also Justice Gagler on the High Court as associate. He's written extensively and published um, multiple important articles on Australian public law. But his recent work is leaving us Australian public lawyers in the rear vision there to an extent. And um, like Dina in her field, he's making waves internationally. Um, and some of that work will soon appear in journals like the Modern Law Review and the OJLS. Um, so I'm really delighted to have both of these thought leaders have a chat in front of us this afternoon. Um, in some ways, their books are very different, but there's also some striking similarities. Both, I think, tell gripping historical stories, which, um, you know, Dean and Dina's is styled a history, but Will's, I wasn't expecting it to be as historically focused as it, as it was. Both are theoretically well-informed and interdisciplinary. And both raise fundamental questions about the often unseen role that law plays in structuring our economic relations and conditions. Um, both also have endorsements, blurbs, that I think <laughs> if I read them out would make these two blush. All right. Um, so oh, maybe I will. What the hell? I'll give you a flavor <laughs> of the endorsements. All right. So Marty Costanini, who is by no stretch a nobody in international law. <laughs> All right. Um, he labels Dina's book elegant, sophisticated, original, powerful. Um, Anthony Angies, have I pronounced that right? Describes the book as remarkable, powerful, and concludes that it's a fresh and valuable work that does and will push the boundaries of critical international law and provoke new lines of inquiry. Uh, Professor Peter Kane praises Will's book for its, also for its um, elegance and lucidity and concludes that this very important book, in this book, Will frequently startles the reader by his ability to see clearly aspects of the world hidden from most of us in plain sight. And um, Tony Prosser concludes the book skillfully and lucidly restores a shamefully neglected subject to its rightful place at the heart of our constitution. So these are very important books indeed. Um, I could have read more from the blurbs. They are quite remarkable. I'm glad you didn't. My palms are sweaty. It makes me very nervous right, when you do so that. Yeah. At the risk of having both of them blush, I'll turn first to Dina and we will enjoy the conversation. So, so I, so. yep, maybe we should swap back. Yeah, uh, yeah, to begin with, I mean, obviously, thank you to Leighton, uh, thank you to Ash, who's done so much work uh, about this, and also thank you to Will, who actually suggested it. The idea of doing a joint book launch is actually his idea, and he should get all the credit for it. 
Um, yeah, so very, very quickly, I think we will cover also some of that later. Um, yeah, I'm an international lawyer by training, as uh, you all know. Um, and this is, this was my, this book started as my PhD in, Jesus, 2012 uh, at Durham University, and I kept working um, on it since. And basically the idea was to have a rewriting and a rethinking uh, of the concept of civilization and international law. And the idea that made me a bit jumpy was this very common narrative that international lawyers will be familiar with, but maybe outside of it too, that you know, international law used to have its problems, it used to have this standard of civilization that divided peoples in different categories and gave them differential rights and duties. But roughly after 1945, this, is, this was over, basically because of World War II and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN, basically international lawyers saw the mistakes of their ways and especially, you know, the overt racism um, inherent in the concept. And basically since then, the standard of civilization has mostly been a relic, right? And if you go, you know, to Google Books and you do a word search for civilization and, and you know, in civilization and civilization in German, this looks like it's true. It, like, if you see the usage of the term actually declines, maybe not after 1945, mm. but certainly after the 60s and the 70s. I think that's already important that it's decolonization and not 1945 that does a trick. But in any case, my question there was like, okay, that seems to be intuitively true, but it didn't square both with my understanding of civilization and international law, but also with my understanding of what lawyers do. And my understanding of what lawyers do is that lawyers make arguments. Lawyers don't define concepts. And even when they appear like they're defining concepts, they are doing so in order to attach legal consequences to them. So my, my intuition was, what if instead of looking for the word civilization, what, instead of thinking that it's the usage of the word and it's derivatives that is actually you know, the most important thing, I start thinking about it as an argumentative pattern that sometimes is encapsulated by the usage of the word civilization, but sometimes it may not. And once I started thinking about it in this way, uh, I started seeing it everywhere basically, and the idea that it stopped onto, uh, after 1945 or even after the 60s and the 70s it came to be basically a very unreliable um, story. And I'm, I'm happy to expand later on um, what type of argumentative pattern I think this is, mm -hmm. but I think I might um, stop now and hand it to Will, who read it very carefully also, so his questions are very good. It's very easy to read because it's an incredible book. Um, I'm just going to very quickly introduce my book and then we're going to get into a, a Q&A format where uh, I'm going to ask Dina a whole bunch of interesting questions about this incredible, her incredible piece of work and then she's going to swap and ask me some questions about mine and then we're going to develop a sort of conversation so far, insofar as possible and then we'll open up to any questions that the audience may have. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Leighton, for that. Lovely but slightly embarrassing introduction. Um, thank you so much for the Centre for International Public Law for hosting us. And thank you, for, thank you to Dina for A, joining the ANU Law School, which I'm exceptionally grateful that she did, um, and B, agreeing and in, uh, being very much involved in the planning of this event. Um, if you hold these two books up, it's, it's quite clear why I needed another person. I mean, this is, one is capitalism and civilization. The other one is public finance and parliamentary constitutionalism. Yeah sort of, that's the Bank of England on the front. This is um, American progress. Uh, sort of, it, it was necessary to have a more interesting person on the stage than, than just me. Um, this book also started as a PhD thesis uh, in, in the UK. Uh, it, the PhD thesis grew out of an attempt to understand a series of puzzles about our constitutional design. One puzzle. Uh, there are no cases in, anywhere in the world about national budget legislation, appropriation legislation. It's the first piece of law that comes into creation in the uh, 16th century, which is endured today. It's routinely passed every year by parliaments. Never been a case about it, or at least so I thought. Um, there's certainly never been a case in the last 100 years, except for some unusual anomalies in the High Court. Um, puzzle number two, what do central banks do? And what relationship do central banks have to um, public expenditure 
generally. So what does the welfare state have to do with money creation? That was another puzzle that I wanted to solve through uh, three years of uncomfortable seats, bad weather and unfriendly people in the United Kingdom. Um, the, the, third, the third puzzle was why are the institutions of financial government so similar everywhere that English is spoken in the world? Um, uh, if you know anything about Indian constitutionalism, uh, you have an Appropriation Act Consolidated Revenue Fund. You have a standing charge for debt repayment. The sovereign debt market in India and Canada and Australia and New Zealand is, and uh, Uganda and uh, Nepal is structured in exactly the same way. Why is that? And so there was an attempt to understand the way that um, these institutions of the national budget law and central banks and sovereign debt, how do they grow and expand? Luckily enough, I found a book that just said, well, there was a bunch of English uh, constitutional lawyers who just used a boilerplate version of the same constitutional text everywhere they went um, as the world decolonized. But I, I digress. So this is the book. The book attempts to engage with those three puzzles. The PhD did first and the book does in a more refined way. It, it seeks to understand the position of the judiciary vis-a-vis -vis the macroeconomic organization of the state, which so far as I can tell is never was never really satisfactorily analysed. Um, it seeks to understand what central banks do. And luckily enough, there was a financial crisis, which let them do lots of stuff. Um, so there was lots of source material for me to um, engage with. It would have been very hard to write about central banks before 2007. Even though they were very important, they were entirely covert. Um, and it also tells a story about the historical development of um, these institutions, the, the macroeconomic organs of the state, treasuries, central banks, sovereign debt markets, taxation, the welfare state, um, defence spending, how, how these, these core institutions, both sort of institutions in the broad economic sense and institutions in the public administration sense, grew in, uh, in a sort of path dependent sense in the United Kingdom and then were transported, um, I use that term deliberately, everywhere uh, the, the British Empire spread its tentacles. Um, and so that's what the book does. I'm now going to stop talking about this book. I'm going to start talking about Dina's book, which is um, sort of, it's a nice, a nice segue about the spread of ideas to then start to talk about yeah. <laughs> capitalism and civilization. So Dina, you've written this incredible book that is uh, so rich, starts with um, a meditation on method, um, and then jumps into a set of sort of obscure but technically demanding um, doctrinal aspects of public international law, extraterritoriality in the late 19th, early 20th century, consular jurisdiction, moves into the Permanent Mandates Commission, and then the Southwest Africa cases and finishes in Iraq. Um, what are the core, what, what's the core argument of the book? And what are, what are three of its big ideas? Thank you. And thank you for being so kind. And also, yeah, I mean, have Will read your stuff? He's an extremely careful reader. Um, so, yeah, as I was saying before, I think the main idea was, what if we start thinking about civilization as an argumentative pattern, as a style of arguing, rather than as a concept, right? Mm -hmm. And from this major methodological proposition came a number of insights. Mm -hmm. One was, and that was the bit I um, did not talk about earlier, which was as an argumentative pattern, um, I found civilization to be both bifurcated and um, internally unstable. What I mean by that is that on the one hand, civilization has basically two propositions. One is what I call the logic of improvement, a logic that says if you adopt basically the modalities of capitalist modernity, so if you have, if you develop um, private law, if you develop separation of powers, if you develop a centralized state system, then of course we will admit you as an equal sovereign within international law. So that's the logic of improvement. On the other hand, there is another logic, and that's the logic of biology. And the logic of biology basically constantly defers mm. the promise of the logic of improvement. Mm. So even if whatever you do, no matter how much you reform, no matter how much you do whatever the IMF tells you to do, if you're, for example, a non-white majority political community, 
or if you're a non-Christian political community, or if you're a non-Western political community, this promise of equal inclusion will constantly keep being deferred based basically on ideas of immutable difference. And these ideas can be expressed within the vocabulary of race. Mm -hmm. They can be expressed also within the vocabulary of sex and gender, right? Mm -hmm. Like either hyper-masculinizing or feminizing some states mm -hmm. and saying, you know, they're irrational, they're a bit too sentimental, and therefore we cannot possibly give them equal mm -hmm. rights and duties because they're just hysterical, mm -hmm. basically. Um, so these are the two poles, and that's the bifurcation, right? And the internal instability is the argument that what looks like the one, what looks like the logic of improvement, if you keep teasing it uh, long enough, it will become the logic of biology and vice versa. So the most obvious way of establishing that is that Western international lawyers, of course, were saying, you know, if you have private law and whatever we will admit you. But by saying that at the same time, they were establishing themselves as the standard setters and the judges of the process. This can only be justified if you're already assuming that the other political community is inferior, right? That's the only way you can set yourself to be the legislator and the judge. So that is, um, that was basically, um, th that's the jurisprudential contribution, if you will. The non-jurisprudential contribution or what makes I think this book specifically Marxist instead of just critical or third world approaches, whatever, is I am saying that basically this bifurcation and this instability is reflective of a much deeper um, truth or a much deeper uh, reality about global capitalism, basically. And I'm saying that this is basically the tendency of global capitalism to do again two contradictory things at the same time. On the one hand, you know, create like homogenize everything, mm. right? In its passage, mm. everyone submits themselves to the necessities of like commodity mm. production and exchange. But at the same time, it also creates differentiation and hierarchy and mm. difference. Like there, there is a dip, like it was through processes of capitalist encounter that, for example, um, Sub-Saharan South Africa became what we would call mm -hmm. underdeveloped. It was an insufficient contact with capitalism. It was that it contacted capitalism in a way um, that subjugated it, mm -hmm. basically. So I'm saying the thunder of civilization does this conundrum because it reflects a conundrum that exists outside of it. Mm -hmm. And it reflects it without being able to solve it. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I'm saying international law is unjust, mm. but on the other hand, I'm saying it's also much less powerful than it assumes itself to be, because at the end of the day, it cannot resolve mm. uh, this conundrum, right? At the end of the day, it is, like, in a sense, doomed to be oscillating between the two poles. So I would say these are my three mm. contributions. One jurisprudential, one broader about um, historical materialism, and one in a sense, a political intervention about what international law is and what international law is not. Mm. Each one of those, um, each one of those aspects of the book, come, you know, is is woven into into a series of case studies. Um, chapter two starts with sort of the pre woke public international law era when um, textbook writers would just come out and say all their horrible stuff on the page. It was they weren't Freudian slips; they were just Freudian books. Um, uh, and then, and, and then you move into um, sort of the the kind of post-war time where there's this uh, a, a significant conflict between forces for um, progressive inclusion in the international community and um, forces which want to maintain imperial status quo through the League of Nations, and then. And then, of course, you go to the South West Africa cases, which an Australian played a particularly invidious role in. Um, and then you get to um, the modern day. And the, the idea, as I understand your book about the logic of um, improvement and the logic of biology, is um, if only uh, non-Western, non-rich states could um, create 
well-organised, well-functioning public sectors, and if they could only have, um, you know, fewer riots, and if they could only, you know, play music on the radio that sounds sounds the right kind, of, sounds like the music that we like in Omaha, then um, then you 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 have full access to the public international order, and you have full equality um, as a state, not just you have substantive equality, not um, formal equality. You end in a funny place because you end with. Um, Iraq, well, it's not a funny place, it's a fascinating place to end. And as someone who's very interested in economics, I was thinking, oh, it's going to be the IMF or it's going to be investor state dispute resolution, because that seems to be the most obvious natural endpoint of this argument. So could, you've explained it to me over dinner. Um, could you explain to everybody else why you picked Iraq as the modern, the, you know, the, the coalition administration in Iraq as the modern exemplar of this tension in public international law? and not say the IMF conditionality and not say investor state dispute resolution? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I think that there are three reasons. Um, one is intellectually persuasive, the other is professionally persuasive, <coughs> and the third is personally persuasive. Mm. So I'll start from the intellectually persuasive and then it will go <laughs> downhill. Uh, the intellectually persuasive, I think, or attempting to be intellectually persuasive mm. reason is because of the historical materialist method, I wanted, in a sense, to use examples that were not obviously economic. So, in a sense, mm. I wanted to show how this historical materialist method mm. can help us understand basically the international law of the use of force and the international law, mm. the international humanitarian law, and specifically the laws of occupation. So this distinction that does exist in international law and elsewhere between, you know, that there's some bits that have to do with political economy mm. and they are the obvious ones, international investment law, international trade law, or law of the international financial institutions, and these are mm. economic, and then there is the other bits that are more political. Mm. And in a sense, I wanted to question that, mm. and I wanted to show what I think is the salience and the richness of this tradition and how it can help us understand fields that we don't immediately and obviously mm. understand through the lens of political economy. So that depending in, on your method, um, the occupation of Iraq, you know, you can understand it as a, a doctrinal question about the laws of occupation, but you can also understand it as a political economic mm. question, which is, how was international law um, constantly reinterpreted in order to allow the coalition provisional authority to basically pass what must have been the most rapidly implemented neoliberal reforms mm. in human history? Mm. Um, mm. So that is basically, that was the, the intellectually coherent reason. The, the truth underneath that <laughs> is first that that's what I had done in the PhD mm. for good or bad reason and that mm. book took long enough as it was. <laughs> so there was a point at which mm. I just had to, to draw a line. The personal reason is when I started writing the PhD, the idea was that the contemporary chapter was going to be about the IMF and it was going mm. to be about the IMF in Greece. And I realized that I couldn't do it. Mm. Like when I tried to write about it, what came out was possibly like <laughs> prosecutable. Uh, <laughs> so I, I just realized it just mm. felt too, literally too close to mm -hmm. home. Mm. And of course, you know, that raises always questions about, you know, how can I write about Iraq? And I think these are, these are genuine questions, but I think there is always a methodological question. How also do you write mm. about home? Mm. Um, and, and to me, that felt such an impossible question to tackle mm. that I mm. had to put a lid on it and, and move on. Put it in a box. <laughs> yes, yeah. and, and move on. But I think you're right, and I think you're especially right about investor state um, dispute settlement. Mm. And in a sense, that's what I'm trying to do next. I'm currently writing a piece about one specific case and basically mm. the way race and racism are mm. articulated. So mm. I think your instinct mm. to expect it mm. it's coming. was correct. It's coming. Yes, yeah. but I think, yeah, yeah I think you're, you're absolutely mm. right that that would have been the obvious place to land, and that's what I'm trying to do in mm. now and in the future.
It was the great, when I was studying in the UK, um, my master's was mainly in public international law and it was the great um, sort of literally wink and a nudge. People would wink and nudge you and they'd say, well, you know, the US has never lost an investor state dispute claim, like wink, nudge. And then and, uh, at some point you start to think, well, but why? I mean, it's, why is that funny? It's, uh, that's, that's strange, unless there is some deeper logic at play which isn't really about the forms of law because the United States obviously is not the, is, is not the most well-improved state. It's not the most stable state. Why does it never lose? Um, and you know, the, 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 that's something that doctrinal lawyers have to grapple with. And that's something that I think they can get from your book in a really important sense without necessarily going into the economics of it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. My second, third question now is about um, your approach to law and Marxism. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a bit of a geek, and I'm happy to have read a lot of China Mabel's work, who is now this amazing um, uh, popular author of sci of um, they call it new weird, but it's kind of fantasy sci-fi stuff. But he wrote his PhD on a Marxist theory of international law, and applied a very strict Marxist framework, the Pashukanian framework of law and Marxism. Um, yours is very different; it's more multidimensional. It includes many other aspects of um, the other uh, that Pashikanis was not concerned to emphasize. Um, could you give a quick, could you explain how your work is different to the Pashikanian approaches, which is an index entry. Your index is much better than my index, <laughs> um, which we'll, we'll explain in a minute. Um, and uh, uh, how your work differs from that traditional law and Marxism um, vein of scholarship. And maybe for the people who aren't so familiar with it, what characterizes law and Marxist approaches to public international law and to law generally? Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, that's such a long discussion. And I'm sorry <laughs> that we will subject you to this weird Marxology uh, <laughs> niche. Um, so basically for those of you who don't know uh, and live happier lives than I do. Um, <laughs> so the, the Pashukanian argument in, in, in Pashukan, Evgeny Pashukanis was a Soviet uh, Marxist lawyer. He got killed uh, in the Moscow trials. And um, before that, he, he wrote this book in which he was basically the main argument was that the legal form, so the legal subject as free and equal, at the end, you know, when all is said and done is nothing more than a reflection of the commodity owner as a central figure in capitalist production and exchange. And um, he also wrote a, I think it was only published in Russian essay about international law. And the argument there was that the absence of state or of a super state in international law is not, um, does not negate the lawfulness mm -hmm. of international law to go back you know, mm -hmm. to the Austinian debate. Actually, it makes almost international law an or mm -hmm. law because the legal form can play out itself in all the violence that exists, right? And one you know, of the most famous um, quotes by, by Pashukanish, which he draws of, for Marx, is, you know, between equal rights, force decides. So between the equal rights of states in international law, force decides, and Mievo, you know, concludes his book by saying, you know, this bloody and chaotic world around us is the rule of law. You know, that was a very provocative um, thing to say, because the idea was that if the rule of law, if, if law is an expression of the individualistic commodity owner, our disagreements at the end of the day can only resolve to violence. So I, 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 have, I don't have much of a problem with that being mm -hmm. of Pashukanis argument and of China Miyavis argument. My problem is that I don't find very persuasive this figure of the legal subject and of the legal form. I think it misunderstands a bit the way law works mm -hmm. because I think at the end of the day, it understands law in a very positivist way, right? It understands mm -hmm. law as rules that have a transparent content. Um, and I think that's, that's mm -hmm. not a great way of understanding law. I think law, mm -hmm. at least Western, when I say law, I mean Western capitalist law, mm -hmm. is, is like an institutionally bound argumentative practice. That's why lawyers are paid so much money to do it, mm. that it is an argumentative <laughs> practice and mm. it's not transparent. Mm. Its mm. meaning is not transparent. Um, so in a sense, my, my, the, the way I diverge um, from China Mievel and from other um, people who write in that vernacular, including, for example, Robert Knox, mm. 
um, is that I, I center law as an argumentative practice. And also I center law as, as I was saying before, as in a certain senses omnipotent, but in certain senses very, very weak and very like ridiculous at a certain uh, extent. Um, and the idea that, you know, law, at, at the end of the day, I wanted to emphasize that law cannot resolve the inherent contradictions mm. of capitalism, rather than a law is only reflective of some deeper truth about capitalism. Mm. That's what I found a bit mm. unattractive, um, mm. the reification mm. of law, and in a sense also the reification of capitalism by taking out ideas about contradictions, mm. and in which contradictions also things like gender and race and sex because that's what popped up play. yeah there's a kind of intersectional law and marxism in your work it's it's not stripped away from identity and it's not stripped away from group identity and 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 the way that like personal identity and group identity can create um exploitation and can create otherness in a really profound way um and, and that's so different to Ch china mabel's i mean not in a negative sense but just very different to that traditional law and marxist approach um Yes, I mean, there's, I mean, I, I'm also not the only one who does. No, you're not, no, 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 no. Very no. fair <laughs> to other colleagues yeah. who are doing mm. uh, this work, right? I'm not, I'm not alone in doing mm. that, but enough about me. <laughs> okay, yeah. we've gone over time. I actually have one more question, but we can maybe we do can, that. Yeah. We can discuss okay. it Your later. Turn. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I, I learned so much about this work, and much like later on, I was actually really, really interested in the historical um, parts of the book, and the parts of the book that um, I think even yourself maybe don't emphasize so much, but I think it's such incredible wealth of archival and historical mm -hmm. um, research. Um, and one of the things I wanted to ask you before, um, before we get into the nitty gritties of the discussion, I think you said you discussed the riddles you wanted to tackle. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, I, I always like to ask this people well, to ask this of people, which is, what was it that it was bothering you? Mm. You know, what one of the things that looked to me like it was bothering you was dicey, right? <laughs> so mm. the very mm. um, you know typical Dyson um, articulation of mm. um, constitutionalism finance, which is that the parliament mm. at the end of the day um, is in control mm. of finance, mm. and you're saying this is mm. a legal fiction. Mm. Mm. Um, or a fiction, not even mm. a legal fiction. Mm. Um, am I right to read that mm. your main target um, was this, there was Dice and especially mm. the reception of Dicey? Um, yeah. Or was there also other things that, you know, kind of bothered you and you wanted to show that there, there's problems in, pub, in the way public law understands public finance? Thanks for that. It's a, it's a great way to think about scholarly motivation because I, I don't know about anybody else in the room, but I write things when things really bother me, they get to me and I sort of stay in the room until they no longer do. Um, uh, the, yeah, so Dicey, Dicey articulated this idea in, he was the first one to do it in a totalizing way as he was with so many things um, at, the, at the end of the 19th century, this idea that parliament controls public money. And that was critical to his sort of Whig view of liberal constitutionalism, this idea that you start at a monarchical feudal past and you go through these troubles and eventually you get to this point in the 19th, 20th century where democracy works, your institutions work, um, and the person, the institution which is in charge of all the things that really matter in society is the representative one, the democratic one, it's the parliament, the congress or whatever. Um, I was, uh, I was, uh, the, I was in the UK when um, the post-financial crisis austerity turned into violence. So I was living in Cambridge when students occupied the Senate House and when riot police were sort of on the street every day for two months. And um, one thing that sort of <laughs> confused me about some of the things that were happening um, and bothered me about the things that were happening in um, the financial rescue packages for the banks in the UK were, were that there was huge amounts of money going out that wasn't legally authorised. So there was um, this unbelievably large sum of money that went to bail out a bank which is since rebranded, it's now called NatWest, Nat it used to be um, RBS, Royal Bank of Scotland. 
and it was just paid for by the Treasury without an appropriate, in violation of the Appropriation Act. So I deal with this in the book at quite some length. Um, uh, this money was just paid um, and it was 24 billion pounds, um, which uh, would have, on a, a kind of reasonable rate of return, paid for all those students, student fees who were occupying the Senate House because university student fees were going up and it would have paid for the police who were fired, who couldn't stop a lot of the looting in London. And so it was, it was, it was the financial crisis kind of missed Australia because we're sort of like a, a, a petro state in, in a funny way. Um, but it didn't miss where I was living in 2010, 2011. Um, and at the, uh, roughly the same time that all this was happening, the High Court of Australia published this very odd um, decision about school chaplains, where they relied really heavily on Dicey's idea of parliamentary control of public money. It's like front and centre to their reasoning. And those two things bothered me to sort of those three things bothered me together. I thought, you know, how, how is I'm, I'm sceptical about Whig history. I'm very sceptical about the idea empirically that parliaments control the macro economy and certainly control the financial aspects of the macro economy, just money in, money out. And I'm very confused now about why this pretty shaky idea, which only has seven pages in the law of the constitution in Dicey's big text, why this idea that's sort of poorly articulated seven pages, um, why it's endured so much that all these jurists in a OECD country just absorb it and make new law on the basis of it. So that was, those were the, that was the, the bothering trifecta when it came to law and macro, macroeconomics for me. Yeah. I always want to know who the enemies <laughs> the are. Yeah. I always, that, that's, you learn was... so much about somebody's project. <laughs> so I, I will pick up from, from the point you were making about austerity mm. um, in the UK. And what I found really interesting, and perhaps mm. I saw your own ambivalence mm. um, coming through, was towards the end of the book, so in the conclusion of the book, if I remember correctly, you're mm. saying there is a problem here. The problem is, on the one hand, the imperative of democratic self-government pushes us, you know, to accept that the parliament should actually mm. be in control of public finance. And on the other hand, you're making a very careful historical claim mm. and you're saying, but it is true that the development of the welfare state mm. did come in hand mm. in hand with mm. the empowerment of the executive mm. on matters mm. of public finance. Mm. And I thought it was a really carefully mm. articulated claim because you're not making it 100% clear if you think that this is a contingent mm. or a necessary mm. development. Mm. And I think again, because we mm. have discussed it, I think your historical research mm is so enlightening mm. in that regard. Mm. So, yeah, so that's right. You've clearly, you've correctly identified my fence sitting and, and I'm fence sitting because I'm not, not entirely sure which side of the fence to jump down on. So it's, um, there's this, the, the, the book starts, the first 50% the first of the book is, is sort of starts in roughly 1688 um, and finishes in, 2000, it's classic legal history um, over sort of overreach, very, you know, there's a lot of a huge, a huge amount of archival work and a huge amount of original, original source work in there. So I, I haven't relied so much on secondary sources, mainly because there isn't much out there. Um, but uh, I look at the way that um, the sort of economic objectives of government significantly changed um, the Role, the role of the parliament and the role of democratic politics in public expenditure in um, you know, the, the, the interaction between the government and, and uh, the market or the government, the financial relationship between government and society. So um, roughly before um, the First World War, all civil, all civil government is just, it, sorry, all government is military. So you know, there's, uh, I've got graphs, the graphs are in the book, uh, they're, Statistic, statistical derivations, um, uh, proportionally civil government spending never, re never tops 10% through the 18th century. It's just, it's all military. There's like five judges. There's some guy who pays the judges. There's his friend and that's kind of it. Um, through the 19th century, civil spending tops out at sort of 
25, 30%. Civil government is tiny. It's a, most of what government does is um, military and imperial, sort of as you'd expect, but it's worthwhile just mapping it out. Then in the First World War, everything changes and um, it ch doesn't change because the military becomes less important. It, it changes because the extent of private wealth expropriation um, factors in this extraordinary way. So you've got 99% income tax or thereabouts, so sort of effective income tax rate. You've got this sort of normalization of very, very extractive um, taxation. And then you have a kind of interwar period and then World War II comes along and same thing happens again at the end of the Second World War, you get the welfare state. And all of a sudden, that balance of civil spending being 5 10% versus military, sort of 95 90% just inverts. It just inverts in 10 or 15 years and civil spending becomes what government does. What it does is pay pensions. What it does is build hospitals. What it does is fund universities. It's just what government becomes in the 20th century. How does this relate to budget law, you might ask? Um, what shifts then is that that kind of annual national budget process becomes completely disengaged from the provision of money to fund the welfare state. So the welfare state becomes, um, starts to be funded through standing appropriations, we call them. So there's no, there's no meaningful vote in parliament every year on should we fund the public health care system. <clears throat> no meaningful vote on that. That's all done behind the scenes in the Treasury. Um, and ultimately, the money the Treasury needs to fund that is obtained through the sovereign debt market. And the sovereign debt market is, from, to a very serious, uh, significant extent, controlled by the central bank. So it's, it's, um, that's the, this, this shift that Dean is referring to where... Tension is partly created because you have a pretty procedural idea of self-government. Right. Mm. Self-government means mm. for the parliament to do stuff. Um, so in a sense, I wanted to ask you mo more about that, like in a sense, to, to explain where do you get your idea um, of self-government and what sort of positive work mm. it does for your argument, mm. but also perhaps what limitations mm. it places um, on your argument, including mm. what I would mm. say, you know, someone could say that this dilemma could be at least not negated, but maybe softened mm. if your idea of self-government assumed that to have meaningful self-government you needed a degree of mm. welfare state. So you cannot have really self-government mm. without yeah. some at least minimal you know social yeah. expenditure. Yeah. And, and and you see that in despotic sort of despotic states or sort of kind of democratic states where what you end up with is parliament stock to plutocrats and it's their children. So you, you, you know, if you don't have some kind of meaningful social society, it's very difficult. Sorry, it's some meaningful minimum standard in society, it's very difficult for people to position themselves as leaders and parliamentarians. So um, there's a, a part in the book where I to kind of have an alternative, to have a sort of, to evaluate whether Dyson's right, to evaluate whether there is a section of parliamentary control, whether that makes sense. Um, I sort of build a relatively academical model. I say, you know, this is an idea of financial self-rule that we can then has these has certain characteristics which we can then use to um, evaluate whether or not the existing practices stand up to it and if, if they do then you have something called financial control um, and it's very procedural um, representative government is not necessarily democratic government depending on your view on representation and your view on democracy um, and uh, my idea of self-government and self-rule is um, minimalist, procedural, realist, um, in, in like a, a sort of, yeah, a political realist sense. Um, it's not, it's not rich. It's not, it's not as rich as it could be, mainly because, um, very difficult. The books are roughly the same size because the editors just tell you how many pages they're allowed to do. Um, <laughs> they just say, this is how many pages you're allowed to have. And you say, but I want more pages. Like, you can't have any more pages. Um, Dean is obviously better arguing with editors about title than I am. Um, but, but you know, um, the, the, this is something I would love to expand on. Um, yeah. uh, but you know, uh, really hard to do um, time time series analysis of the financial crisis and all sorts of this stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And another question I had um, was well, it has to do actually with the fact that we are doing this under mm. CIPL, right? So with the interface mm. between international and public mm. law, which is those of you who 
who share a corridor with me and Will know that one thing that we love to do is talk about Adam tools. Mm. Um, and um, for those of you who have read Crashed, for example, the book about the financial crisis, I think we, ha we have discussed this a number of times. What, I, like, what keeps me up at night is the moment I realize how heavily dollarized the global mm. economy is, right? That at the end of the day, and that became very clear during the financial crisis, the, really the Bank of Last Resort is not the Bank of England, even in England, it's, it's the Federal Reserve. So in a sense, I, I, my question had to do with what does it mean to think about public finance through the vernacular of public law in an era that, you know, finance is so heavily internationalized and not just internationalized, right? It's dollarized, right? It's internationalized in an asymmetrical um, way. Like, what do you think it's still, why do you think it's still important to think about it through the vernacular of public law? And what do you think could be, you know, the- Domestic public. Domestic, yeah. oh yes, of course, your domestic yeah. public law, yes. Yeah, look, it's a, been asked me that question. I said, that's, that's the greatest weakness of the book. I said, I won't ask you that question then when we were doing the thing. And I said, no, no, you need to ask me the question so I can tell everybody. It's the greatest he did weakness agree. He did, I'm yeah, not asking him without his consent. It's true. It's the greatest weakness of the book. So, um, what, you know, I look at, uh, I look at, and I, there's a disclaimer, like I'm not trying some meta Commonwealth analysis. When you, when, when you're in, when you spend time in Oxbridge, you find all these people, like the Commonwealth's still a thing. And, it's all just the same, you know, Canada and Uganda and Sierra Leone and India, and they're all the same. I, I'm not doing that, but I do look at parliamentary government as a paradigm case, use uh, parliamentary government in the Anglophone. So I, I don't look at, I mean, I, I do, do look at America, but not in the book. Um, I don't look at Congress, congressional systems or presidential systems. I look at parliamentary cabinet government and um, I look at, uh, I look at it throughout, throughout the, the world. Um, unfortunately, that maps onto the Commonwealth, and you have to do the disclaimer um, that I'm not wearing red corduroy pants. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the, the the problem with that is that I'm looking at the domestic organisation of each one of these um, constitutional jurisdictions, um, and looking at the way that their government operates and the way their central bank operates. Um, and the truth is, in there's a whole bunch of legal structural reasons, not sort of super structural economic or social reasons, but actually um, they're all, they're all, their freedom of choice constitutionally is very delimited by the choices of um, American and that's because, and, and that's not, that's not conspiracy theory, there's sort of these, you know, the, the Federal Reserve Bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia is currently lending US dollars out to Australian banks, um, which it obtains through a statutory contract sent into the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to obtain US dollars because so many contracts in Australian commerce are denominated in US dollars that when <clears throat> there isn't enough money in the economy, which happens during financial crisis and pandemic, the central bank actually pumps US dollars into um, domestic economy. Now these are, uh, and there's many more, you know, these, are, these examples scale and scale and scale about how, um, you know, you can't really explain what the relationship between any state, except, not even China, that's the interesting thing, any state um, and its macroeconomy without thinking about the relationship between that state, that macroeconomy and the US economy and the US state. And, um, and so that's, um, I've got some, some work coming out, which tries to start to engage with this stuff. Uh, it's very difficult to do mm. in a in a in a kind of in a rigorous legal way. Um, but I'm try, I'm trying to do it. Um, but yeah, so it's it's the greatest challenge of doing kind of old institutional law and economics. And we can talk a little bit about what that actually means. But trying to understand the way that the institutions of law create and control the political economy. Um, uh, is, is, you know, everything comes back to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and everything comes back to treasury auctions in the US and the US regulated banks that um, lend, that, that end up directly or indirectly paying 70% of the world's public sector workers, nurses, teachers, um, sort of all 
in, a, in an institutional, legal, empirical sense, traces back to um, Manhattan. And on, my, on that note, <laughs> I think yeah. now that we have both given you know, our yeah. coming soon sort of situation, uh, I think we will revert back to Leighton. Um, okay, well, we, we might wrap things up. So join with me in thanking both of our authors, and we'll give them a, a round of applause in a minute, but also join us outside for a drink so we can toast what I think are, as I said earlier, two remarkable books and books that will go on to become <laughs> central to the literatures that they're, uh, they're intervening in. So thanks very much. That was very interesting.